good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Dave Deptula, Dean of the Mitchell Institute for Aerospace Studies, and welcome to our Aerospace Nation series. Um, as you all know, we've started live events, uh, but at the same time, we're going to continue the Aerospace Nation series because uh, we can get out to a lot more people uh, than uh, just the in-person events. So we're really pleased today um, that Lieutenant General Dave Nahum could join us. Um, as most of you know, uh, General Nahum is the Deputy Chief of Staff for Plans and Programs, also known as the Air Force A-8. And it's in this role that he leads the development and integration of the Air Force Resource Allocation Plan. And as the Air Force's senior programmer, he leads the development, integration, evaluation, and analysis of the Air Force programs across the future year's defense plan. So in many respects, pragmatically speaking, he's the most critical person on the air staff next to the chief and the vice. So as you can imagine, budget season is a very busy time of year for him. So welcome, Abu, and thanks very much for taking the time to join us today. It's great to see you again. And what I'd like to do is start off by giving you an opportunity uh, to make a few opening remarks because I'm sure our audience would like to hear more about your testimony regarding the Air Force budget, uh, particularly its implications on force structure and the services modernization program. So over to you. Oh, well, well thank you, sir. And uh, again, it's, it's an honor to speak with you and, and uh, the whole team today. So I, I appreciate you giving me a chance uh, to have a, have a couple minutes here. A few, a few words and then uh, obviously uh, I'll open up to your questions, sir. Uh, you know, looking across the long-term investment um, of the Air Force, uh, we, we do have a, a narrow opportunity uh, to modernize it and do some really, really good things. Uh, with that, there are some challenges. I would say that the two main challenges, uh, aging fleets um, uh, and the, the money it takes to recapitalize, and then the excessive demands from the combatant commands in current day operations are probably the two things uh, that are, are the most challenging. Uh, opportunity, though. Uh, the uh, the pr President Biden's interim national security guidance uh, continues us on a, on a path for peer competition, uh, and he even, even offers some insights about uh, about risk and, and how to get there, which is which is very important. Um, to that to that end, though, if we're going to get there, we're going to have to look look at things a little bit differently, and certainly how not only we work with OSD inside this building and the other services and the combatant commands, so we plan out how we. Uh, how we tend to take that risk and take that risk smartly, but also working very closely with Congress, showing what that long-term vision looks like. And that way, when we, we show that long-term vision, we find some of the short-term changes seem to be a little easier to get through uh, some of the local districts around, around our country. Um, much, much of our re recent testimony has certainly ben benefited from what, what I think is the Air Force um, in my mind, from what I've seen, is doing a better job of messaging. Um, you know, General Brown certainly started us on uh, what I would say is the uh, the largest change in strategic messaging that I, I, I've certainly seen in my in my, in my time uh, in this planning program and business. It started with uh, his accelerate change or lose paper he put out, uh, followed followed shortly by his his action orders, uh, and then really a lot of work. Uh, from General Brown's level on down about the not only internal but external messaging, making sure we get that message out, uh, get that that the uh, the correct messages out, uh, and then broaden that out so we have many messengers on that on those correct messages. So the Air Force is speaking one voice, uh, and, uh, and and I'm hoping that's uh, that that's making a difference out there. Um, with regard to our budget, um, the. Uh, uh, I would say um, balancing risk for the winning force, um, the capacity and capability are certainly something we're talking about because some of the capabilities we need are very expensive, but some of the capacity we need is what the combatant commanders need today. And that, that, that's always gonna be that, that balance moving forward. I think you're seeing some of the uh, implications on our, our force structure. Uh, we, we can talk about some of this stuff, but uh, right, you're hearing me talk a lot about right-sizing fleets, uh, as well as um, uh, removing some fleets from the Air Force altogether. Um, the, uh, uh, when you uh, 
when you look at uh, obviously when you, you look at right sizing and moving fleets, those can be very contentious on the hill. So we work very closely with that, uh, with the um, uh, uh, with Congress on that. You hear a lot about legacy platforms. Legacy is not an age thing. The uh, to me, legacy. Uh, I thought Chairman Milley put it very correctly when he said legacy to him is relevance. Uh, this is um, uh, when I talk about something that's a legacy platform. It, it has limited or no no relevance in that that high end peer fight. Um, uh, an old platform that has a lot of relevance, the B fifty two, and then there's much newer platforms that have lost their relevance over the last uh, 10, 15 years, as the threat has certainly accelerated um, uh, throughout the world. Uh, you're going to hear some big changes, uh, not only in the nuke portfolio with uh, strategic base, uh, the strategic based uh, strategic deterrent replacing Minuteman three bombers going from three to two. You heard the chief talk about fighters go from seven fleets down to four plus one. We can certainly talk more about that. Uh, changes in ISR. We look at ISR, and I will say, I can almost say this across all our platforms. You know, when you have when you're looking for a capability, when you're looking for a platform. Um, it's got to be persistent, so it can persist in, in a threat area. It's got to be survivable, and it's got to be connected. Uh, and certainly, we look for that in ISR. But you can, again, you can broaden that out across all our platforms. Uh, quite a bit. I still the, the the advanced battle management system. Uh, you're going to hear us talk a lot about the budget, about training ranges and simulation simulators, because uh, we've got to uh, right size our training ranges so we can train to the threat. But a lot of that training, because of the nature of the threat and the nature of the limitations in many of our ranges, is going to be going into the virtual, uh, making sure we get this right. Some concepts we've talked about before, but certainly you're going to see those invested in uh, ACE, so the the Agile Combat Employment, the ability to operate away from um, uh, well-established bases, and then certainly the critical infrastructure defense, base defense. How do we how do we defend things as an Air Force in, in threat areas? Um, I, I know we're going to talk a lot more about, not more about these subjects, sir, so I'll turn it back over to you for questions. Okay. Um, thanks, Abu, for that uh, context and the uh, insight. And let me say, too, right up front, thanks for everything that you and your team are doing. Um, I don't think everyone in the audience are, understands how much goes into uh, the, what you guys in the uh, A8, guys and gals in the A8 are doing. Uh, and uh, uh, certainly those that have been there before and have worked with the engine room recognize that, but uh, keep up the great work. So let's dig a little bit deeper into some of the topics that you raised. Um, uh, we'll start with an easy one, Abu. We'll start with readiness. There are lots of definitions out there for what readiness uh, includes, uh, everything from capacity and capability, which you touched on, to availability. So. What's your take and how would you characterize the importance of modernization in relationship to what makes a force ready? Um, there's a lot you know, I, there's a lot of aspects of that. I'll tell you one thing about modernization I am very much key on is that you know let's take our fighter force and really our bomber force as well as two good examples. You have a, you have an aging you have aging fleets that are becoming very difficult to maintain and fly on, on a, uh, at a level that our air crews need to, to train at the, at the highest levels. Uh, we need to modernize so we can fly. Um, and you look at some of the challenges, certainly with the B-1 fleet, certainly with the F-15C fleet, and there's many others out there. We've got to modernize, get some new platforms that we can fly at, at a level uh, that we can maintain our readiness across the fleets. So I, I certainly think there's a tie-in. And when you look at us not executing all our flying hours, um, well, that that's certainly that's certainly related to increases in WSS costs and, and fleet availability, et cetera. Uh, many of those um, problems get solved if if you can find that relief with the combatant commands, so we can have some time and room to modernize some of these fleets. Uh, very good, appreciate that. Um, what can you tell us about the? Uh, your bomber modernization efforts are are we on track for a 225 plus bomber fleet of b21s and b52s in the 2030s you know right now with the bomber fleet well the the, the, the focus for right now and I, I sometimes i sometimes i gotta you know that's why the, the, the beautiful thing in the air force is divided the five and the eight i got cue to keep looking long over in the five uh, sometimes I get myself in the trenches. Right now, where I'm very focused on the bombers is 
we've got to get to a two bomber fleet as quickly as possible. If we do, you know, right now the B-21s are being built. Uh, as you heard Ms. Costello talk about in her testimony a few weeks ago, you know, the first ones are already formed up and we're, we're going to start flying here in, in, in the not too distant future, the B-21. Once we start that, we're now at a four bomber fleet. That is not affordable. The, the, B, the B-1 and the B-2, as phenomenal as they are, we've got to get those out of service as the B-21 comes on and get ourselves to that two bomber fleet, which is a B-21 and a modernized B-52. With that all said, in the meantime, the V-52 is going to go through a lot of modernization efforts with the the, uh, CERP, the uh, civilian engine replacement program, uh, as well as the RMP, the uh, the radar modernization program, as well as some other digital backbone within within that that frame. And so we're going to have a, a a deficit in availability while those airplanes are being modified. That is my my biggest concern on the bomber fleet is over the next I'll call it five to seven years as we bring on the V V-21. And then just beyond that, as we start bringing out the B1s and the B2s eventually, uh, I think this is the critical time. Now, do we want to grow to that 220 you talk about? Absolutely. But I'll tell you right now, we got to get through these next five to seven years uh, very smartly. And then I would say out to about 10 years uh, when you start seeing the, B, the B1s and B2s start, um, uh, start heading to the boneyard as we, as we bring on this uh, modernized two-bomber uh, two fleet. Um, Abu at uh, Mitchell Institute, we brought up uh, countless times the importance of nuclear modernization. Uh, and uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts on the continued opposition to ICBM modernization by uh, some of the arms control folks and uh, others in uh, Congress. Um, what, what are your thoughts there? I don't want to get into the, um, the the posture, the nuclear posture piece, because that, that's not certainly not, that's out of my wheelhouse. Um, I think as an Air Force, uh, we are we are tasked with two thirds of the nuclear triad plus the nuclear command and control piece. You know, our job right now is to modernize the two legs we have. That's the bomber leg, and we're certainly doing that with B twenty one, and on the missiles with the, the GBSD. Um, it is very important getting to the GBSD. Uh, it is a, it is an incredible program right now. Uh, wonderful things are happening in that, that program uh, with the digital with, with the, the, uh, the digital modernization with, with that missile system. Uh, slepping Minuteman 3 is not the answer. That's more expensive than bringing on the new missile system. We've got to get to a modern uh, missile system for that leg of the triad. And then and on the B-21, we've got to bring on a, uh, uh, a, the, the next generation of a, of a penetrating bomber uh, into the nuclear force. And then with that as well, is the, the nuclear command and control, whether that's SAOC, uh, the E4 recap, or the other elements of the nuclear command and control. So our focus on our focus in the Air Force is not on what's going on in the uh, the policy world piece. is is our task is to modernize those two legs of the triad, and we're certainly on on, on a way on a path to do that. Yeah, you mentioned it. I'm, I was going to bring it up, but I'll just reinforce the fact um, to those in the audience that perhaps haven't heard it, but they're has been an extensive study on the cost to slep or extend the Minuteman 3. Uh, and that study resulted in the fact that uh, that option would be much more expensive than building uh, a new ICBM. Uh, so why do that? So thanks very much for uh, 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 reemphasizing that. Now, another area that, that gets a lot of attention um, is the fighter force. Uh, and since the Air Force has announced its intention to transition, as you mentioned, from uh, seven to four fighter aircraft plus um, the A-10, could you share with us uh, a little bit more on the timeline on uh, A-10 retirement and uh, the plans for a next generation air dominance aircraft as well? Yes, sir. So, uh, and I know uh, the chief has talked about this. I'll go through the, you know, the, the four plus one. Really, you know, the Air Force right now, we're, we're, we're sitting on seven fighter fleets, and it's expensive. No other Air Force in the world is sitting on seven fighter fleets. And, um, and so getting us down to four fleets, and that is, uh, as the chief said, the next generation air dominance, which will, which will eventually replace the Raptor, the F-15EX, which gives us that outsized weapons capacity as well as a very uh, robust capa capacity capability for uh, critical infrastructure, critical infrastructure defense. The cornerstone of our our, our high end fighter fleet, the F-35, with the, the TR-3 and Block 4 modifications, and then 
Uh, what you hear me talk about all the time is a, an affordable multi-role airplane. Uh, right now, that's the F-16. Uh, we have about a little over 600 post-block F-16s. Our intention is to upgrade those with um, the uh, APG-83 ESA, ESA, ESA kit, as well as some other enhancements to that aircraft. And that'll give us 15, 18 years of the ability to do those other things that we don't need high-end fighters for, like Homeland Defense caps uh, in Operation Noble Eagle, uh, events out in Afghanistan, other places in the world, uh, and, and do it very affordably. Uh, the plus one is the A-10, because we have it around. Our intention of the A-10 is we're sitting on 281 airplanes right now. That's nine operational squadrons. We want to slightly right-size that down to 218 airplanes, and that's seven operational squadrons. Why seven? That gives us the ability to leave one squadron in, Korea, in the Koreas, uh, uh, at Osan, uh, as well as in six other squadrons. Of those six other ones, that's three Air National Guard, one reserve, and two active duty. And that, that is enough squadrons and airplanes to do a constant rotation to offer up the combatant commands, one A-10 squadron on the road at all times. We feel that's about the right size for that fleet. Uh, because it has very limited utility in a high-end fight, we're only using it in, in the next, in the coming years. Will be it be in in, in a low end conflict like an Afghanistan or a, or a Operation Inherent Resolve type type of event. Um, that reduction is going to happen over the next two years. Going from our, our request of Congress is going from 281 to 218. Uh, the 218 we keep. We're going to put all new wings on them. We're going to do all the the avionics modifications that we need to keep that airplane robust for the, the coming years. Uh, and then that'll be a decision for, for another day when we actually start phasing those A-10s out. That will not be in the near term. Um, well, thanks for that. Um, uh, from uh, Mitchell's perspective, uh, we think that the nine to seven squadrons a very smart move uh, and really retains uh, a lot of capability because as you mentioned, the A-10 has little or no utility in a high-end fight. The other point that we have to keep on hammering home to people is close air support is not an airplane. It's an outcome or an effect. And we can conduct close air support um, with any aircraft that can drop bombs in the Air Force inventory. Uh, but uh, good on you on that move. I understand the high degrees of emotionalism that are involved in this uh, issue. And I think you all put together an excellent plan in that regard. Um, no, sir, if I, could, if I could add one thing to that, too, I think what's very important for your audience to understand is we, we do have a resource problem. It's not just money. It's people, too. You know, we went down this F-35 road to replace A-10s and F-16s. Well, we're replacing F-16s, but we're not replacing A-10s. Um, if you look over the last couple of years, we brought on over 300 F-35s. It's now the second largest fleet in our fighter fleet uh, past the F-16. Um, we've got to start repurposing some of that manpower. And I'll tell you right now, we're at the point, if we don't start retiring some more legacy fighters, we're, we're at a huge manpower problem, specifically in maintainers. So this is a very, we're at a very important point. If we're going to continue taking on new fighters, we've got to send some away, or we have to grow in terms of end strength as an Air Force, which we know we, we can't afford that either. Right. Uh, again, an outstanding point. Uh, and uh, we just get to get, get by some of this emotion. Uh, if anybody is looking for uh, a force who lives, eats, uh, uh, lives and dies by close air support, it's the United States Marine Corps, and they're doing it with F-35s. So the question is, why are we hanging around for the A-10 so long? But that's a hypothetical question. You don't have to answer right now. You and I both know the answer. It, it's called um, all politics is local. All right, let's move on to munitions. Often the limiting factor in uh, war games uh, in the Air Force as well as the other service components are limited numbers of munitions. Um, are you convinced that we're procuring sufficient stocks of preferred munitions such as JASMs, LORASMs, and AMRAMs? And let me put that in the context of a 100,000 plus aim point conflict, which is very different from the 15 to 20 aim points a day that we were striking in uh, ops in Syria and Afghanistan. Uh, so I, I would say, you know, in munitions is a, it's a great conversation. I, I'll talk broadly about it. I gotta be careful though, cause it's, it's pretty easy to get to a classified conversation with munitions. Um, you know, you gotta be careful. We're not, um, as we, as we 
as we purchase and and r run around with fifth generation aircraft, we, we're not putting third generation munitions on them. So there's a balance. Uh, we've got to continue to procure what's out there as some of the munitions you just suggested. We also got to make sure we have enough resource uh, money uh, in our ET and efforts into advanced munitions that are going to be those munitions that we need in high end fights that are beyond what we're, what we're, what you're seeing right now out there. So we're certainly balancing the money. Um, I actually think we're at a good balance right now. Um, I, I think, uh, I would actually like a little more money into some of the advanced, the advanced, um, RDT and &E efforts. Uh, and, uh, we're going to continue working with OSD to continue pursuing those, but I think we're at a pretty good balance right now. Uh, could we use more money, more resources, more ammunition? Absolutely. But again, with, with what I have to balance right now, I think we're in a pretty good spot. Yeah, I know. I think you said that very well. Um, you mentioned them in passing, but could you give us a little bit more insight on uh, next generation munitions, such as the uh, stand-in attack weapons, uh, air launch rapid response weapons, and the hypersonic attack cruise missiles? Well, you, you, as you see, the Air Force is committed to hypersonics. You're seeing the developments in, uh, that are playing out with the uh, the, the Arrow, the, uh, uh, the the hypersonic we're going to be uh, uh, putting on a B-52. Uh, very excited about that, uh, as well as some other hypersonic efforts you, you'll 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 hear about shortly. Um, so I, I think I think we're in a good spot right now with uh, with some of some of the uh, the RDT efforts in the Air Force, uh, and we're gonna we're gonna feel the hypersonic uh, well ahead of the other other services very very shortly with Arrow. We're pretty excited about it. No, that's great to hear. Um, switching gears a little bit uh, to a subject that you've heard uh, a lot from us here at Mitchell about. Um, what's your view of the impact of the $39 billion that are in the Air Force budget, but that actually go to other government agencies? In other words, the, the, these pass-through dollars that distort perceptions of public other services in Congress on the funding that the Air Force actually receives relative to the other services. Uh, so, I, you know, the pastor is a, it's always, always an interesting topic. Um, you know, from where I sit, I, you know, uh, we, we got the, the top line we got and we, we have to uh, um, uh, work on that. Um, what I'd like to see the pass through um, uh, that, that level of funding somewhere else besides on the Air Force top line, yes, because it, in, in my circles, uh, when people see the Air Force budget, and this is you, here, in, here in OSD and other places, they, there's a perception we're, uh, we're a little healthier than we actually are. So uh, would I like to see it another place? Absolutely. Uh, I think we're, we're, you know, we as an Air Force, we're gonna continue to work uh, in, in OSD with the other uh, agencies around uh, that, that are, are, are part of the pass-through, as well as with Congress and the, um, uh, certainly the appropriators uh, to see if we can uh, uh, display our funds differently in the future. We'll, we'll continue to work that, but in the meantime, uh, this, this is what I got as the Air Force A, and uh, we'll uh, we'll we'll um, make a good Air Force in what we have. Yeah, no, I know you need to work with it, but that's part of the problem. By the way, for the audience, this isn't this doesn't require any congressional action. All this is is an OSD action to put that thirty nine billion dollars uh, where it belongs, and that's in OSD accounts, not the Air Force account. Um, so, what's holding you up? Okay, uh, acquisition reform. Uh, here's a subject that uh, since before even my time in the Pentagon, uh, DOD and the Congress have been talking about the need for uh, acquisition reform. Uh, in today's Air Force, um, part of that uh, is this whole notion of digital engineering. So how are digital engineering efforts changing this conversation um, at all, if they are? Um, for example, can you explain uh, the digital twin efforts and how they're being applied to NGAD and the T7 and what that might have to do in terms of changing this acquisition uh, paradigm that we're stuck in. Yeah, you know, and I, I would say on this part, I'm, I'm probably not your expert to talk to this, but uh, I hang out with enough experts here, so I probably can talk a little bit about it. You know, one of the things you're, you don't have listed up um, that you, you didn't list there uh, in your, your opening, your statement there was uh, a GBSD which is a, an incredible uh, example of uh, digital engineering as well. Uh, I think, you know, you know, can, can we change as, as, a, as an Air Force, as a DOD? I, I think we can. And I think the digital engineering is going to allow us to change. I think the T7 is a great example of how, how an industry partner can change uh, about how you build a, a new platform. 
Um, and uh, I, I think certainly we, we in DOD can, can look at this differently too. And I think you're going to see we are in some of these programs. And I, I would say probably one of your best examples is GPSD. Uh, and I think we're, we're uh, I think people are surprised at how well that program is doing and, and how, how well it's progressing. We're, we're very excited about the progress being made. Um, and uh, uh, digital engineering is certainly a big, a big part of that. Um, T7, you know, right now I know there's there's a couple of uh, uh, issues with the T7 we're working through with the, the manufacturer. We think we're in a good spot though with the T7. We know we're going to have a great trainer. Uh, we know we're going to have the numbers we need starting in the in, the, in just just a couple short years. Uh, and we wouldn't have had it this fast. And then these numbers wasn't for the digital engineering that the, uh, that the manufacturer has employed with that airplane. So uh, I think it is going to change. Um, it's but it. You know, like anything in this building, we're you know sometimes we we pedal pedal a little slow to catch up, but, but I think this it will change. Um, very good. Um, now you have talked about in your previous remarks the 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 balance that has to be made between the demands of today, um, as well as the uh, the requirements for tomorrow, uh, in the future battle space. Uh, capabilities like a joint all domain command and control and the uh, advanced battle management system uh, are going to be critical to sense, make sense, and act faster to close multiple kill chains uh, and uh, succeed when we conduct joint force operations. So with that, can you go into the importance of the Air Force developing these capabilities uh, as well as integration with the other services and how that's all going to happen? Yeah, I, I actually uh, right now I think the advanced battle management system and JADC too. I, I'm, I'm I've been getting more glass half full on this uh, over the, over the last several months. Um, uh, I certainly see the the services working very well together uh, uh, for the Air Force's side. Uh, Q Hino and his team with uh, Jerome Valencia. Uh, um, they uh, are doing some great work with the Army and Navy on. Uh, uh, on uh, convergence and overmatch, the other, the other services efforts, and really what the other services are doing with their their ABMS like efforts is important for their services. What's important for all of us is that you know what we do in ABMS can share data uh, with what the Army is doing with convergence. And I think we're down, we're down, we're on a path now where, where that's going to happen. And I think that that's probably the, uh, uh, the the best thing we can hope for. Um, you know how. How do we have platforms uh, sense data, um, use that data, and share that data at machine speed? Uh, and I think we're we're going down a road where I think that that can happen because we, we we understand uh, you know it's it is about the data, um, and uh, and uh, we certainly are setting up the, the programs that are going to allow us to get there. Um, you know the, the days of uh, uh, a decision maker needing information sending a U2 or another platform down a road and report back 18 hours later, those days are gone. Uh, you know, decision makers need uh, inf instant information. Uh, and then at the edge, the, uh, our, our war fighters need absolutely uh, instant information and use of that data. You know, as I always say, you know, what, you know, what if uh, in, a, in a future world, which we, you know, some say we're there right now, you got a, a F-35 flying over a place like Syria uh, and sensing information, because that's what F-35s do. They, they grab in data, but then what happens to that data? And directly below that F-35 is, uh, uh, is a soft team. And right, that F-35 is seeing things and, and sensing data that that soft team could use. How do I get that data to that soft team uh, at, a, at a machine speed? Right now, though, that, that connection's not there, and it needs to be there. And I think we're, we're on a road to make sure that what, what that army that army unit is doing with uh, inside of their project convergence and where that that f-35 is inside of the the advanced battle management network we're in a position where we're sharing data instantaneously and that ground unit is able to take advantage of what that f-35 is seeing and sensing and i think we're going down that road it's pretty exciting right now well that's great news to hear i would also add that uh, as you're talking we need to make sure that that data connection, that data flows from the F-35 down to the team without going back uh, to some centralized command and control center where some process uh, that is in place holds it up and there's a mother may I request 
uh, and you know, three days later, the answer pops out. So it's all about uh, empowering uh, the warfighters at the edge, not only to collect the data, but to assess it and make decisions as well. So it's part of that entire dot mill PF system that has to be addressed. And I know that's not in your- Sir, I, I, I agree. You hear a lot about mission command and it's, it's, a, it's an exciting topic. It's certainly out of my world. Yeah. I do money and investment. And I make sure we got the stuff, the stuff, the stuff that need bought. Uh, but uh, you know that that that's a great you know for my my previous time as a warfighter, I, I couldn't agree more. I just uh, uh, we'll, we'll we'll all have to watch that one closely, though. I agree. Yeah. Well, people listen to your voice, so everyone needs to speak on that one uh, to prevent the the mistakes of the last twenty years of uh, Mother May I and uh, quite frankly inhibiting our forces from taking act action that uh, could significantly degrade our adversaries, but we're held up by process. Um, uh, but uh, I'll move off of that one and uh, let's uh, round out this discussion before we open it up to our uh, audience. Uh, and let me ask you a bit about uh, industrial-based concerns. What, what are some of the Air Force's uh, top issues uh, and interests, if you will, over sustaining the industrial base for uh, air combat systems? Uh, yeah, obviously, again, you, you're um, a little bit out of my wheelhouse as the eight, although, again, I, I, I hang out with the people who talk about this all the time. Um, hey, so, I, told you, I told everyone up front, you're the most critical guy on the air staff outside. <laughs> of the I, see, I do seem to be in a lot of conversations. Uh, you know, it, it is certainly, uh, you know, you look at industrial base and, you know, you look, you know, look at aircraft manufacturers, if you look at how many how many companies are building airplanes 40 years ago and how many are building airplanes today, it is certainly a concern. Um, you know, you, uh, you know, certainly industrial base and cert and, uh, uh, it's certainly as you, as you move parts, uh, and other things are around that we, that we need, it's certainly something we're keeping an eye on, uh, outside of COVID, you know, we had our challenges. COVID certainly was uh, made, made some things a little more challenging, I think for, 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 for everyone. Um, you know, I, I think uh, when you look at um, uh, uh, our, air, our, our air, how we're going to produce aircraft in the future, uh, making sure that we actually have more than one or two options, I think is, is very important because competition is good. And I think you saw that in the, the T7 is a great example. You know, competition is good. We have a, 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 a se several companies um, uh, putting in a bid. You, you end up with a, a really good product at a really good price. Um, so I, I think it's very important, something we're very concerned with, and, and we're going to continue to watch moving forward. No, very good. Well, we've come to this, uh, to the end of this segment of our discussion, and um, I, I've intentionally uh, tried to uh, add some additional time for uh, questions from our audience. So, um, Abu, thanks again for your insightful comments and uh, sharing your uh, extraordinarily valuable perspectives. Uh, before we jump in there to Q&A, um, I did want to uh, put in a plug to our listeners that um, our next event will be next week on Tuesday, uh, the 20th of July, when we'll be rolling out our new policy paper entitled Speed is Life, Accelerating the Air Force's Ability to Adapt and Win, uh, written by Heather Penny, a senior fellow here at Mitchell Institute, and we hope you'll join us for that. Okay, we're now going to open the session to Q&A from the audience. Um, I think uh, most people on here have uh, been through the routine, so I won't waste time here, but uh, please identify yourself um, when I call on you uh, and go ahead and uh, uh, make your question. So let's start with uh, Steve Tremble. Steve, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Steve Tremble, Aviation Week. Um, I'm, uh, I want to ask you about another um, uh, sort of facet of the budget discussions and it's MQ Next. Um, you know, we were tracking the RFI released last June that talked about sort of a MQ 900 killer but survivable replacement in 2031. Uh, another RFI dropped in March that sort of reoriented, it, it seemed, to a high value airborne asset protection role in 2026 or 2027. Um, can, you, can you just sort of say where that sort of fits into the force structure? Do you see it, it you know, replacing F-16s and F-15s and CAPS and HVAPS uh, operations? Um, and, uh, you know, uh, yeah, if it's so near term 2026, 2027, are we talking squadrons, wings? Uh, what's the force structure for this? Thanks. 
It's, uh, it's it, 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 really interesting question and, and certainly what, you know, a, a hot topic around here about the unmanned systems. I would say in terms of MQ-9 specifically, uh, with what the MQ-9 brings us uh, in, in our joint forces, it, it's a wonderful capability and we have over 300 platforms. Uh, we got enough platforms to take us into the middle 30s. So for terms of what the MQ-9 does for us now, we got some time. And so when, there, when there's time, that's good. So now, now we, we can actually proceed smartly. Uh, we're obviously looking at a, a lot of different unmanned, uh, unmanned systems for different uh, different duties out there. Uh, I'm sure you're following our Skyboard. We're, we're actually looking at some of the um, uh, manned unmanned teaming and how that applies to not only um, uh, air superiority but other other missions out there. Uh, and we're uh, we're looking very closely at many uh, uh, many different options and many different technologies uh, in the in the manned unmanned teaming side of things. Um, Certainly, there'll be unmanned systems and, and ISR, and look, look at as, as we look at things that, again, are persistent, survivable, and connected uh, and uh, in, in ways that we haven't done before because, you know, potentially there, there might be some uh, things where we could actually have um, um, uh, families of systems, uh, potentially smaller, lower cost. There's other, th other technologies we're looking at, but right now, the, with the systems we have, we have a little bit of time to look at this uh, before the MQ-9 and the other unmanned systems fall off. So uh, I know that's not a complete answer, uh, but I'm trying again. I'm trying to avoid some of the classified the classified research that's going on, as well as um, uh, you know, uh, let, you know, we're, we're in early stages on much of this. Okay. And, and, and actually, if I have one follow-up, I'll say in terms of what a a squadron unit is going to look like. I'll tell you, that that's a great conversation. We are having that actively. I'll tell you on the fighter side is, what do, what does a fighter squadron look like 10, 15 years from now? You know, is it a man-to-man type teaming thing? Uh, do you have training assets inside the fighter squadron like the uh, the Reforge program that ACC is looking at? You know, what, what does that look like? Because I, I think it's an important conversation uh, because as we start looking at some of these more exquisite, expensive platforms like NGAD, like a Block 4 F-35, uh, we we shouldn't just assume that it looks like the F-15s and F-16s that we all grew up on, you know, 24 primary side airplanes and X number of pilots and maintainers. It may may look differently. That's a, that's an active conversation we're having right now. Yeah, let me just throw in there, um, Abu, particularly uh, just to emphasize the point that you made, particularly when we're bringing on uh, uh, unmanned uh, autonomous uh, uh, aircraft. Uh, to perform a lawyer in a loyal wingman role. I mean, you can't be much of a wingman if you're in a completely separate unit that's segregated from the one that you're flying with. So perhaps these kind of man to man teaming unified uh, uh, squadrons may be a way to go. But uh, as you heard General Nahum say, that's still in the in the study role, uh, study mode. So let's turn to Brian uh, Everstein. Brian. Hi, yes, thanks. Uh, this is Brian Everson with Air Force Magazine. I was hoping to touch on a mission area we haven't talked yet, and that's airlift. Um, this, the Air Force wants to cut back on its C-130s, and that idea has kind of gotten some pushback from the National Guard, who have said that that doesn't take into account the domestic mission. Can you talk a little bit more about the reasoning for cutting back on C-130s, what um, impacts would be if those cuts were blocked, and finally, to what extent the most recent mobility capabilities requirement study from just a few weeks ago goes along with these plans. Thank you. Yeah, it's, a good, it's a good question, and uh, it, it is it is a big topic right now. Um, you know, we we've said out loud that we want to take our C-130 fleet from 300 down to 255. Uh, that minus 45 is about five units. Uh, we're working very closely with the Guard Reserve because the, the old C-130s are in the Guard Reserve. We're working very closely with the units, seeing if we can find mutually agreeable replacement missions, and we've been successful in some places. Um, perfect example is one of the one of the units, the C-130H unit at Montgomery, we're going to we're actually going to remission. They're going to become our training site for our MH-139 helicopter. So there's there, there's there's ways we can do this in uh, in a very positive way with the Guard and Reserve. We're certainly going down that road. Um, we are the 255. Without getting into the, the details of you know O plans and things like that, 255 covers what uh, what we need for uh, for our tactical lift fleet and includes uh, support to the homeland. And so we, we are taking into account all the missions that our C-130 uh, crews uh, do every day, which is just just phenomenal. We also have to under understand too the tactical lift fleet 
carries probably the least risk of any of our fleets in the Air Force. We have got some high risk of some of our fleets, and it's not in the tactical lift. So we've got to balance that risk across our portfolios. And I think that's important conversation. And the last thing I'll say, too, is when you say tactical lift, everyone goes straight to the C-130. You know, I'm looking at future, some future tactical lift. There, there's some technologies out there right now that I think we need, we need to stick our nose in and keep an eye on. Because when you look at logistics under attack and how we're going to move things in a modern battlefield, it may not be in, in a herc. There are other things out there that we may need to move, uh, to move goods, fuel, uh, aircraft parts, et cetera, in contested space. Uh, so we want to make sure that we don't just invest in the herc and the attack lift and then lo lose sight of some of the advancements we need. We, we have to have, just like anything else, we have to have that balance in that portfolio. Um, thank you for that, Abu. Um, let's turn to uh, Teresa Hitchings. Teresa? Hi, thank you for doing this, sir, especially after having to testify on that very long hearing yesterday. <laughs> um, and speaking of that hearing, I'm Teresa Hitchens, by the way, with Breaking Defense. Um, speaking of that hearing, uh, maybe I misheard, but I was listening very carefully to the director of the CAPE in how he was talking about the various tactical air studies that are ongoing. And it seemed to me that he was suggesting that there is going to be a direct cost affordability trade-off between NGAD and the F-35, which is slightly, I think, counter to what we've been hearing in the past. And so I wondered if you could address that, that question of the affordability trade-offs that CAPE and that yourselves are looking at as you go forward with your study. Thank you. No, you know, um, uh, and uh, uh, Mr. Nogueira spoke, I, I guess I didn't catch that nuance. You know, if you look at the TAC Air studies out there, uh, the Joint Staff, J uh, and CAPE, are, 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 are conducting a broader TAC Air study for the entire department, uh, which I, I think is very important. In fact, I have a session this afternoon with them that I'm really looking forward to, because as we look at our TAC Air portfolio, it's not just about the 2,000 or so Air, Air Force airplanes, it's about the 1,000 or so um, uh, Navy Marine aircraft as well. They're a part of what we do with our TAC Air portfolio looking forward. So I think it's important that we, ha we have a good study uh, that takes into account the entire department. The Air Force study, though, as we talked about the four fleets, um, I don't, you know, we don't see the trade off between NGAD for F 35. We need the F 35. We need what the F 35 brings, and what we're very focused on is the F 35's capability right now. Getting the F-35 to that Block 4 um, uh, TR-3, Tech Refresh 3 capability, because what that brings is what we've done in the past with F-16s and A-10s, but now we can do those things in contested environments. Break, break. NGAD is about assuring air, air superiority, air dominance uh, for the future. Right now, the, the dominant platform uh, in, in the world today is the F-22. And we think it'll be that dominant platform for the next couple of years. We're going to continue to upgrade it, and make sure it stays dominant. There comes a time when we got to move to the next platform, and that's what NGAD is going to offer us. Um, to me, that is something that's completely separate with where we, we need to be with our F-35 fleet. And if you, if you see where the money is specifically, you're seeing no money move between NGAD and F-35. We are, we are pursuing both programs very vigorously. Thank you hey, Teresa, let me jump in here, too, because I think one of the things maybe said in a little bit different fashion, uh, General Nahum did a lot more kinder than uh, I will, but affordability, what's the definition of affordability? And how can you talk about affordability if you don't talk about the effectiveness piece? This is one of the problems with CAPE, and the department will continue to have until they start focusing on cost per effect not just some ambiguous affordability nature or number. Um, the other point I'd make is it's very disconcerting to hear the department slip back into terminology that I thought we resolved 20, 30 years ago. Um, airplanes aren't tactical or strategic. Airplanes are airplanes. Um, there's no such thing as a tactical aircraft. There are fighters outcomes or what they enable uh, are either tactical level effects or strategic effects. So, and we got to get rid of this tack air term 
and get back to calling it what it is. It's a fighter study. It's not a tech air study. Um, with that, yes, let me sir. turn to Pat Hose. Yeah, sir. I, real quickly, I, you know, uh, and I, I, I use the word tech. I'm not, I'm not a fan of the word tech air, but that is the lingo in this building. I, Sometimes I you just got to go with it. Stop fighting it. I, and, uh, I, I got so. it. I'm, it's not a criticism yeah. of you, but this is what happens with semantics. People fall into it, and in, 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 in and they don't understand what they're saying. Uh, yes, sir, I will. I will say though, the one affordability part that we do we have to be cognizant of is the Air Force is tasked to do things that the other services are not tasked to do. And that's you know, sit in Afghanistan for forever, or sure. um, you know, the homeland defense missions we do every day that are mostly with our international guard uh, partners. Uh, we at the Air Force, we've got to find that the missions that don't need F-35s. We've got to figure out a way to do them affordably, or we're, we're going to break as an Air Force. The F-16 is, is helping us and saving us right now because the F-35 is not flying at the, the affordability marks that we need to. As we continue to work the F-35, thankfully we have F-16s for the next 15, 18 years to fill in some of those affordable affordability missions that I'll, that I'll call. No, I, I got it. I mean, you know, I use the example that the F-16s last two years um, at, at Balad, it was tasked for road wrecking every mission that you could have done with an MQ-1. So I got it. But again, that is the effectiveness piece. It's the cost effectiveness piece. And my comment on affordability is it, it, it's a bad word because it doesn't, doesn't relate cost to the mission effect that you're actually trying to accomplish. And what you said is perfect. Yeah, you, you don't want to use a platform that has exquisite capability on a mission that you can get by with something uh, that is not as costly to sustain or maintain. Okay, let's move on to uh, Pat Host. Hi, Pat Host from James. I agree with you both. We should just call it the fighter study. But anyway, sir, I also have an MQ Next question. Um, one of the most interesting missions for this future aircraft to me is the high value airborne asset protection. Um, I'm wondering if you envision the MQ Next to be just a missile sponge that uh, attracts missiles and other munitions away from these high value aircraft, or do you anticipate the MQ next being an aircraft that actually shoots fires in defense of high value aircraft? And the other question is, I was told tankers and AWACS would be uh, examples of high value aircraft in this scenario. What other aircraft do you envision being defended by an MQ next? Thanks. Uh, well, sir, yeah, okay, and I, I, I agree. I, I, fighter study sounds great, um, but uh, the uh, um, it's a tough question to ask. You know, because we're, we're we are we are doing a lot of very very uh, robust RDT and E, and what we're going to use, you know, what do what do these systems of the future look like? And uh, when you talk about manned unmanned teaming and what you can use unmanned systems for. Uh, and it's not just things, fly, uh, platforms flying, it's other uh, other effects out there uh, on the battlefield. Uh, I don't want to get into uh, too deep into this one because I got I think I'd be um, uh, scratching at some, some classified studies ongoing. But safe to say that um, there's a lot of places we can use unmanned systems in the future um, um, and uh, in, in much different ways than we have in the past. And we're, we're pretty excited about where this takes us. Will there be manned platforms? Absolutely. Uh, will there be unmanned platforms in different ways? Uh, yeah, you bet. I'll tell you one, one thing, uh, you know, just a, a totally different from what, where you, you were taking me away from HAVA. One place we're looking very, I would say one of the, one of the places we'll probably get to the quickest is some, some unmanned adversary air. We think, there's a, we think there's a lot there. And that gets back to that first question you asked me, uh, uh, General Deptula, it was about the readiness. You know, there's ways to use unmanned systems in ways we haven't thought about in the past. Uh, that technology is allowing us to do uh, moving forward. Can I follow up on that real quick? Can you give me mm -hmm. an example of high value aircraft that would be defended by this MQ next? And perhaps why would you use a brand new UAV that would possibly be low observable in adversary air? Would it just simply still be cheaper than alternative manned platforms in that scenario? Well, sir, I don't want to get, get into defending uh, HAVA with uh, manned or unmanned systems. I, I want to I want to steer clear of that. Uh, you know how how we are. You know we we have high value systems uh, out there that we, we as an Air Force will always be tasked to protect, and we as an Air Force will always protect them. 
uh, whether those are going to be protected by manned or unmanned systems in the future, that that is something we're having those conversations right now. I don't, I don't want to commit to either way, whether it's going to be a specific platform right now. All I'll say is that uh, defending high value systems in the future is going to be different because the nature of the contested environments we're, we are going to be fighting in are so much different than we we envisioned even just a few short years ago. Thanks. Uh, Frank Wolf. Yeah. Uh, hi, General. Um, just a question. Um, the UK uh, has been uh, moving out on um, swarming drones effort. And I just wanted to get sort of uh, your take on um, on a, sort of a swarming drones concept. Uh, I guess their squadron 216 has sort of been moving out on that. And I wanted to see what what your take is on it. Um, and I had a separate question just in terms on the on the B-21 uh, uh, issue in the future bomber uh, mix, getting down to the two uh, the two aircraft, the B-52 and the B-21. Um, is it is it right now you're with the you're, you will have the 76 modernized B-52s? Is that the current thinking? So I guess that would leave room again for the 149 possibly uh, B-21. So I just wanted to make sure that the 76 is the number you're you're working with. Yeah, the, 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 the current B-52 fleet will all be modified um, uh, with, with the, uh, the, the, the engines, the, uh, the new radars, uh, and, and the digital backbone. Uh, the B-21, obviously, my, my focus right now is getting the B-21, keeping it on, keep, it's, the program's doing wonderful, uh, keeping it on track. And I'm really, obviously, as, as, as your money guy in your Air Force, I'm very worried about the transition, because transitions are tough because they never give us enough resources for overlaps. And uh, and we're talking about a significant overlap here. So I'm watching it very closely. What number we get to, we can have that conversation another day. Uh, and in terms of swarming drones, I, I've been reading about the um, uh, what, what's going on in some, some of the other countries, not just the UK. Uh, very exciting stuff. I, I would just say we have many R&D efforts on many types of unmanned systems that are very exciting uh, and uh, uh, we'll, uh, we will certainly go down the road of many, many of these technologies you're hearing about as well. Okay, Garrett Rhyme. Hi, uh, yes, hi, General. Um, my question is as a follow-up about um, future tactical uh, lift aircraft. Uh, are you talking, I presume, about eVTOL aircraft or, um, or some other type of fixed wing aircraft? Uh, could you elaborate on what, what possibilities you see? You know, I, I tell you, there, there, there's obviously a lot of things we're, we're, we're watching. Uh, the the, uh, the EV tall with the uh, agility prime effort is obviously, you know, that, that that's not going to replace a Herc or anything right now. Uh, but the technology is very exciting, and we're we're excited where that could take us. Um, certainly, we're watching very closely what the Army is doing with uh, future vertical lift, um, as well as some other technologies that are out there right now that we've. Um, We've gotten some some briefs from from a few uh, a few companies about some uh, technology out there that could uh, be used in a tactical lift scenario with either smaller or even no runways. Um, that that stuff is obviously if you if you think about a contested environment, uh, whether that is in um, uh, somewhere in the Pacific or somewhere in Europe, uh, having that ability uh, could could be very attractive. So we want to make sure that just like any uh, any competency out there. We are uh, obviously pursuing some of the technologies that are here today, like, like a C-130J or some of the modifications on the C-130H, as well as what we do with C-17s every day. But we also have an eye to the future because uh, um, you know, there may be a way to move, uh, move things uh, faster uh, in, in, into smaller areas. Uh, and obviously, uh, when you look at contested environments, um, that, that's certainly something we're, we're going to be interested in. And uh, Kathleen Robertson. Let me see. Thank you. For, um, I wanted, um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, I, wa I wanna go back to the importance of the F-35 and as you talked about, um, as it's flying overhead, particularly obviously for special forces and soft mission, the, the ability to relay the information, the critical information to the guys on the ground. Um, right now, there seems to be a lot of challenges in that platform having the ability to do that. Um, 
do you want to talk about that as far as because it seems to um, suck up a lot of resources in the software world. Yeah, I would say in that scenario, uh, you know, I was certainly picking that scenario more for the advanced battle management system and, and how we would move data. Um, I, I would almost separate that out from some of the challenges we're having with F-35. We're, we're, we're very well, obviously, we're all, I think everyone in this, the, on this VTC right now is very well aware of some of the challenges with F-35 uh, and the modernizations effort moving forward. Um, the F-35 has been, is, is a very good platform. It's been very good. And as we've been saying all along, uh, we would like it to be outstanding though. Uh, we we kind of see what an F-35 that's outstanding looks like, and we're trying to get there, working very closely with the companies, uh, the joint program office, the other services, and certainly the partner nations that are flying it. Um, the opportunities of the F-35, I think are just, just incredible. Not, not just because of the, what the platform could bring, but the fact that so many of our partner nations are going to be flying alongside alongside of us, and uh, um, so we're, we're pretty excited. I, I do see a world where we can move data like that. I, I do. I, I see where uh, uh, ABMS is bringing us. I see where when you get F-35 to the block port capabilities and we build the infrastructure that we can move data, use that, that data at the edge as well as move, move it throughout the battle space, um, I think the F-35 is going to be a big, a big part of that. Again, it, you know, when you talk about persistent, connected, uh, and survivable, the F, that, that, that is the F-35. Um, but do am I? Uh, I'm, I'm not naive enough to uh, say that I'm, I, I, I know there's not challenges ahead of us to get there. Um, it, it is more expensive than we would like. We have not taken any money out of the F-35 program uh, since I've been in this job. In fact, what we've done is add money to the program now. We're buying less airplanes because what because what we're spending is is, is been more than we would have anticipated. A lot of it's on on the modernization. Um, we'll continue to work that. We would like to get to more F thirty fives, and we would like to operate them cheaper. And we'd like to get the modernization efforts that we need, uh, specifically the tech refresh three and the block four. Um, but we we know we have some work to get there, um, and so. Uh, uh, again, I, I'm I'm very hopeful, but uh, but I I, I I agree with you. We got some work ahead of us. Thank hey, you. Abu, let me ask you a follow on. Would, would you care to comment on whether or not we need to evolve the JPO? I don't want to get too, uh, you know, uh, too much into that. It, and that's a tough question for me to answer. Um, you know, uh, I think we're working right now in, in the construct we have, it's important for us to work very closely with the JPO and the other services and the partner nations. And then, obviously, uh, with the uh, the manufacturers, specifically um, Lockheed Martin, Pratt and Whitney, uh, to get to the, the affordability levels that we need, uh, especially with the modernization. Uh, and I think right, right now, um, you know, could there be a better construct? I, I don't know. I, you know, right now, I think I think we see ways to work inside this current construct that can be very, very beneficial. And I know the uh, the, the chief is um, uh, very very high on this airplane. Uh, he's been working very closely with the uh, uh, with the JPO and the, and, and the manufacturers as well, trying to get to the Air Force to a better position. You know, we as the Air Force, we're buying the most of these airplanes, so people kind of look to us for that that leadership role in the F-35. Uh, and we as an Air Force, I'll you know uh, repeat with the Chief and certainly General Kelly and other leaders inside the Air Force said is we like this airplane. Yeah, you know, I tell you, uh, I, I got to go out to one of the bases, um, talk to a lot of the crews and. These are crews that came out of A-10s and F-16s and F-15s and other airplanes. To, to a person, to, to a, a man or woman that I asked, um, you know, if, you had a if you're going to war to war, you had a choice to go to your old airplane or this airplane, which one would you walk through? They go, absolutely, I'd walk through this airplane. So there, there's a lot of confidence in, in, in the system out there. We now have to make it better because we know it can be better. Um, it can be that airplane that we need to be that cornerstone fighter that the chief talks about. I know, thanks for that. Real quick, because uh, we're running out of time, but uh, Courtney, let me get to you. Courtney Alban. Yes, uh, Courtney Alban with Inside Defense. Um, I know the mobility capability requirements study was mentioned in an earlier question, um, and I just wanted to, to ask, I know Transcom led that work, but um, now that the results are out, um, can, can you speak to how those results kind of aligned with the trajectory that the Air Force is already on um, in the mobility capability area? And, um, you know, are there any like points of difference there uh, in those results? 
Yeah, I don't want to get into the details of the MCRS because uh, right now I know they're, they're, they're just now downstairs analyzing that. Um, uh, but I, I will say that, you know, when you look at where we are with Transcom, we're in a pretty good place. We had a really good year with Transcom in terms of the tankers. We kind of came together uh, to, you know, when Transcom talks about mobility capabilities that they need for their requirements worldwide, uh, you know, obviously we, we sit up and listen, but what they, they need to understand from the Air Force side is I've got to balance risk across all, all a number of portfolios, not just the mobility portfolios. And in many cases, the mobility platforms aren't carrying as much risk as other platforms in the Air Force. So I think we've come to actually a good place between Transcom and the Air Force, understanding each other's uh, problem set, the, the risk we're carrying, and how we can come to a better balance. And I think we've showed that with the tankers now. Uh, we've gotten them, uh, uh, and I think you're seeing this publicly, that the Transcom uh, leadership and the Air Force leadership, are, I think, are in a very good place with tankers. Uh, we, we got a little work to get there with the, the C-130s and the attack lift, but I, I think we can do it. Um, we, so we have a great working relationship with Transcom. And I think regardless of what the, the MCRS says, we have to balance, you know, when they said this is the level of risk you're carrying by the levels you're leaving behind with TAC lift or strat lift or whatever the case may be, we also have to tell them that we, you know, if we over invest in those those aspects, then that money is coming from, you know, ISR or uh, fires or you, know, you name the other place in the Air Force. And, you know, we're carrying risk in places that it has to be very, very uncomfortable. Uh, and uh, I don't have that level of, of discomfort in some of the mobility platforms that I do in places like weapons systems sustainment or some of our ISR platforms, which are carrying much, much more risk. Well, we've come to the end of uh, this uh, Aerospace Nation event. You know, at the beginning, I talked about how General Nahum's job is one of the most critical. Um, I think all of you also recognize it's one of the most demanding and challenging uh, and uh, uh, Abu, you've done a magnificent job, and we very much appreciate uh, your candor uh, to address some of these very critical issues. So a big thanks uh, again to General Nahom, to you and our audience, from all of us, the Mitchell Institute. Have a great aerospace power kind of day.